first, if you've never used Today's Meet, it's a great little back channel discussion. Uh, we created a room, you just go to todaysmeet.com, um, pop in your email, and then the room is the, just I-M-L-E-A-C-C-C -C -C for the four C's. And it's just a way you can ask a question, especially four of us here. You can throw in a little comment or a question about something. If you have it right now instead of waiting, and one of us will probably see it and be able to respond to you right away. Um, we'll leave the room open for a, little, for a week. That way, if you have uh, questions later on you want to ask, it's just an easy way to get a hold of us, although you'll find there's a bazillion ways to do that. Uh, the pencil trick I want to talk about real quick and explain it. First of all, pink sticker people, raise your hand. If you've got a pink sticker, that looks like a majority. that's it. That's by far a majority. We don't need to see anything else, right? If you are not pink and proud of it, go ahead and raise your hand also. Oh, yeah, that's oh, winner. All right, thank you. Winner, winner, she's okay. I call it, we'll call it a draw. Call yeah. me a natural. It's all about making you feel good. Uh, now, what we, we will do the pencil spinning thing when kids are coming for preview day before they're even, they even know if we're even going to be one of their teachers. We teach them how to do that. Uh, in class, we'll use it to get kids to kind of buy into the fact that, you know, it may take a while. You know, to learn something, and one of the things that we'll tell the kids is, how many times it took you to spin that pencil, that's how many times you have to work at something before you can come to me and tell me you're not able to do it. And, and you know, we'll, we won't give the kids near as much instruction as we give you. We let them struggle for a while. Yeah. So that's just one little way to kind of give you some, you know, give a little downtime. We were talking at lunch that he'll use it when he realizes, ooh, I didn't time this very well, and we'll spin the pencil for about five minutes in class. But that's just one little thing that we use. You doing your little clicker, Jimmy? Yeah, okay, my little clicker thing. Okay, so this is us. By the way, if you haven't seen things, there are, um, I've got a website and all the PDFs are going to be on there. We've uploaded some stuff to the Google Drive for, for the, in the folder that they sent out for this. Um, there's also some QR codes you can scan on your way out. The ones on the inside and on the door are the same, and they'll take you to direct PDF links to the PowerPoint, an article, and a book chapter from him. Uh, but I'm Tony, by the way. That's my short, bald, fat guy. Um, my son's. Tall guy yeah, son's. is Kevin, and that's Dave Brobiak over there. Okay, us versus them. We use competition, but it's not always a bad thing. We use competition a lot for our teams. Our seventh grade is very closely teamed. When I say that, that means English, social studies, and science. Unfortunately, I took math out of our team a couple years ago because we had so many math offerings in our school, it became difficult. We've been trying for six years to get it put back on the team. Uh, I, all apologies to all the people we ripped off. These are our emblems. <laughs> You've never seen this before, soccer people, but these are all of our team things, so they kind of permeate everything that we do in our building in the seventh grade. Um, to go off of that real quick, is sent the back of the screen if you don't mind. I already hit <laughs> I know that. The idea of those symbols is the two guys in the red shirts, they both teach on the same team. Social studies English. He teaches social studies on a different team. I teach English on a different team. We're very much into team identity, team unity. And that's where our competition comes in. It's not just that you're in my English class. You're in my English class and you are part of our hero's team. Our mortal enemies are the Globetrotter team. We're the ones over there on the red. And we so were that's the first two teams in the building when it opened 16 years ago. There was just two of us. And so it became a natural competition. And then the Stars came in the next year. And so they're the new team, even though they're 15 years old. And so as the new team, they're sort of Switzerland in the middle. We came up with symbols to represent our teams that the kids buy into. And the idea being is that when they see that hero's symbol, they know it represents me. When they see the white with the line, they know that represents the Globetrotters. And when you see the eagle, it's going to represent the stars. And so that's those different team symbols come in. It represents who we are. So it's not just my class. It's the idea of this overall team. You can click that. Thank you. <laughs> I have one job. And, of course, I mean, a lot of this just pulls to right from, right from Glasser's five needs. You know, belonging being the key. Because as you know, belonging is at its absolute highest, you know, grades six through eight. That's when kids are looking for that identity. They need that identity. And so that's what we're trying to provide, either individually, kid to kid, or within our classrooms, or within our teams, or within the greater school. And everything else falls into play. I mean, we'll take care of the fun and the freedom and give the kids the empowerment by doing all of these things. Where are you going? Okay. Are you can you quit now? Sure. Okay. How many of you are junior high, middle school? It's in those school I'm just, I, well, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of people that aren't, we have elementary people, but I will tell you, that those of us that teach that, we know, if you don't give them a sense of belonging, they'll find their own. And normally what they find for belonging is what we don't want them to belong to, which is what started us on our journey 
to begin with, because we had our first girl bully. Now it's been it's been a while. 12, 13 years ago, we dealt with our first girl bully with power, and we did, we had to make some adjustments in our culture. And the way we did it was is we ramped up this identity thing. All right, and two of the people up here are Star Wars geeks. Uh, I'm not going to point them out. <laughs> I have no problem with that. I know. Take pride. Okay, so these are kind of the ideas of what we're going to take you through fairly quickly, give you an idea of, of, of what we do to carry with these, uh, this idea of a common jargon uh, within our teams and within our classrooms, shared experiences so all the kids can have the same thing, they can talk about it with each other, even previous year's kids, um, creating unique conversation pieces within your classroom, and then, of course, fulfilling the need to belong. So this is where we're going. I have one. Oh, <laughs> So, some of these phrases, and we're not going to go through everything because they're unique to us. The key is that when you see these things, you don't necessarily know what they mean. Our kids will. And you probably have some of these things that you use with your kids. If you don't, you need to develop them. You need to come up with a few phrases. You know, the ladies and gentlemen is just simply what we use to get their attention. We all have attention getters. So, that's an easy way to think about it. 80-10-10 is how we, how we uh, stress to the kids... What kind of quality work are you doing? You want to talk about 801010 and what Mr. Brobeck talk about Soul Kid Alley? You know, 801010, I like to do it by food and illustrations. At the beginning of the year, I tell them, I said, look, you know, my grandmother was a wonderful grandmother. She's a wonderful cook. And if you look at most grandmothers for dessert, they'll give you a cookie. And so my grandmother, you know, if she was an 80 grandma doing what 80% of the people did, she'd give me a cookie. But I said, my grandmother was not that. My grandmother was a great grandmother. So she was at best an 80-10 grandma on that, and I have cookies. And I take a cookie and I put frosting on top of it. And I said, my grandmother was an overachiever. She did what most grandmothers do, 80% of the people would do. She put frosting on it, which put her in that next echelon, that next 10% of what people do. But I said, to tell you the truth, my grandmother's better than that. So sometimes my grandmother would put sprinkles on top of that frosting, on top of that cookie. So instead of being, she was the, what 80% of the grandmas did, she'd be what 10% of some grandmas did, but she was in that rare 10% at the top. And I said, it's memorable. For all 28 of her grandchildren, you know, she was an 80, 10, 10 grandma. Just the same way we want you to be in your assignments. And so when kids turn assignments into me and I give them back to them, I will write, this is 80 work. This is 80, 10 work. And I tell them why. This is 80, 10, 10 work. And I tell them why. And so it becomes a vocabulary in our teams, even amongst themselves, they'll look at each other and say, that's awesome, that's just 80, 10, 10 work. The power for Tony and I is, it transfers anywhere on our team, but it doesn't transfer off our team. And so our kids have a unique binding jargon that is unique to them. Or they'll look at each other and go, you have to be a globetrotter to understand. And then we smile. And that's one of the big things to hit on, that idea of having that that phraseology that just fits your room, your class, your team. I remember when I was in high school, I had a science teacher that started every class with, hello campers, and he'd always have some kind of stupid camping joke. And that was how it was part of his class. I hated it, I would not do it as a teacher today, but it's that idea of having that thing that was just for his class. The idea of slow kid alley comes from my class. It's when you lose the right to be with the other kids because you don't know how to behave, I said, you're a slow kid. And they would freak out, like, what? I'm like, it has nothing to do with your intelligence level. You are slow to pick up on social cues, when to talk and when not to. So you get pulled away from everyone else, and there are desks that are set against my chalkboard where you don't get to interact with the other kids. The kids named it Slow Kid Alley after a while. So I kept saying, you're slow to pick up on cues. They started calling it Slow Kid Alley. I'm like, hey, okay. And so we just sort of went with it from there. And now, years later, it's just become Slow Kid Alley. Kids not in my class have no idea what we're referring to. It's just a matter of finding that thing that works in your class and owning it. I have one job. <laughs> okay. I have to tell you that a lot of things that happened in our classes happened by accident. Screen. Screen. All of a sudden. Thank you. It happened by accident. One day, it was in my first year of teaching. Uh, my children were not understanding what I was wanting them to understand. They were staying here, and I wanted them deeper. And I looked at them and I said, you guys are like lambs. You're academic lambs. You're cute, you're fuzzy, but you're academically not prepared for my class. I said, the first step that you got to do is you got to admit you have a problem. Because I looked at my desk and I saw a stack of note cards. So I passed them all a note card, and I said, okay, I want you guys to write on that card, I'm a lamb, and I live in a box. 
And I said box only because there was an Amazon.com box in front of me. I clicked their cards after they put their name on it, signed it, and I threw it in the box. I left them there for a couple days. The kids came up to me and said, how do I come out of the box? Mm. <laughs> you become interesting to me when you start thinking. And so I one day grabbed a kid out of the box and said, you become interesting to me. Other classes came up and said, how do we get in the box? Uh, okay. <laughs> 16 years later, if you pull up my book excerpt, you'll see a picture of a girl who's got hers in a frame. It is now a big ceremony. I have a lion. They become academic lions when they are not a lamb. I have a frame in my room where we take their picture. I tear their card. I write, I'm proud of you. I draw a daisy. I tell them it's a lion, but I can't draw. I sign my name. Kids carry these things to college with them. We see them at their open houses on their boards, and it, I tell them uh, only about a third of my kids come out, which, of course, is about right for those that understand. Well, a couple of years ago, like 12, uh, a young lady who's now a captain in the Marines uh, built me a box for me to throw their cards in. And so now it is a huge ceremony day to take them out of the box, accidentally created, but it's vocabulary jargon. It's, a, it's just for our team. Our team has lions, our team has lambs. Um, I, I would just say we, we're talking a lot about teams, but I've seen this work in individual classrooms. If you're not teamed, these things can still work for you. You just have to create them. You don't have someone to bounce your ideas off of. Well, you still do, but they might not be your team. It might not be a team jargon. It would just be in your classroom. He could do the same thing uh, and if it was just him, but having Tony and then Brian, who teaches science with them, it goes across the three of their classes. They can use it amongst themselves. And it works. Like you said, my kids have no idea. If they say lions and lambs, they're totally lost. They have no idea what that is, but there's different jargon for different teachers, just like there is in yours. You have different jargon that you use, different words that you use. I have one. All right, so these are just more phrases, things that the kids just get to use, uh, get used to seeing. I mean, they're all, again, the thing to stress, it's not about teaching you a phrase. We can't teach you a phrase to use in your class. It's recognizing when those moments happen because most of these things just kind of happen on accident. And some of them are a little more deliberate, and then we kind of realize, oh, a kid's picking up on it, and we decide to make that effort to push it. And that's, that's really what your job is, is to find these little phrases and terminology in your classroom. And if you don't have them, if you're going, I don't really, I can't think of these, pay attention over the course of the next few weeks. Look for spots to insert something and start to build on it. And I will tell you that you, there's no greater, I guess, indicator of how effective this is, is when you get the uh, salutatorian at the high school who integrates two of the Globetrotter unique phrases. He put in Akrazia and Kobayashi Maru into his speech, as the salutatorian speech. You know, along with, along with the, the jargon is the actual experiences, things that your students are, the, are going to experience because they are in your class or on your team that no other teacher is doing. And I know in this day and age, we're all about, well, we've got to do this the same, we've got to do this the same. No, we don't. You can do things the same and not have them be the same. You can have your own experiences that they're not going to get if they are not sitting in your classroom. And so, I mean, we, we go from, I start from the first day of school telling the kids, I lie to them all the time. And, and they've already learned this point of the year, are you telling me the truth? I'll, I had them all convinced, you'll see my room in a little bit, that I am not a Star Wars fan. On the first day of school, I convinced them that I lost a bet to him and he decorated my room. And that's what I used to kind of set up this idea that I'm going to lie to you all the time because I want you to think. I need, your, I need you to be able to recognize what really makes sense and what doesn't. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Uh, we'll talk about, we'll see some of these things like the coffee house and the blank assignments and uh, learning to breathe. Drinking poison is his. You want to talk about that real quick just to give it another idea? Um, we both do the same story. We both teach seventh grade English and I'm spacing on the name of the story. Landley. Landley. Thank you. Wednesday. I know. Uh, and so what I do with it is I convince my kid, I do it with just my advanced kids, and I convince them that I have a friend that works at Eli Lilly, and the end of the story is the main character drinking cyanide. But the only way to pick up on it is clues in the story, talking about the fact that bitter almond taste, things like that. And so I go and I have a little jar that I have filled up with uh, almond extract and lemon juice, and I have a little eyedropper, and I tell the kids that I have a friend that works at Eli Lilly, and I got permission to bring in poison and cyanide for him for the day, and I go around with an eyedropper and I let them taste it. I let them know that you cannot taste it if you have any kind of nut allergies because it could kill you because cyanide comes from nuts. It doesn't come from nuts. 
Uh, but it has the almond extract. I don't want to I don't, I don't like kill them. Uh, and I go around and I just I give him a little dropper and I can have more than one dropper. I'm like, no, legally I'm only allowed to give you one dropper full. And so I go around and they just put out their tongue and it's that connection to the story. And they go home and tell their parents that I poisoned them in class. Uh, I don't ever come out and say otherwise. I have kids who are currently in college who think that I poisoned them when they were in seventh grade. Their parents say, that could never happen. And they go home. And I'm like, well, your parents have to say that because they love you. I don't love you. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> and so it's that idea that even though we teach the same story, it's something that just happens in my class. So it's the idea that I took ownership of it. And those kids who've gone through my class, that's something they buy into for me. So you don't have to do the same thing as other teachers. You find that thing that separates your class apart. And the key is that the kids, your previous students then... They'll come by the room and oh, yeah. have, they, have, have you poisoned yet? And the kids will sit around there, you know, in seventh grade, like, what? what? Have we done what? Or my kids will, have you yelled in the parking lot yet? I'm like, no, we got that coming up next week. Especially now that I've taken pictures and posted things on Instagram and that kind of stuff. I, I took a picture of my kids learning to breathe one day, which I teach them all how to breathe. Come, they don't know how. And it's really just making them look goofy in front of everybody. So when the goofy thing comes up later on, they go, I don't want to do that. Like, Stood on your chair and waved your arms up in the air to Faith Hill. So I think you can do this little activity. But I post that, and then I'll get previous students who are following me, and they'll they'll start making comments about other things, or they'll reinforce what we did there and talk about how they remember it. And so then my current students will see it, and they'll be able to make that connection. And it's all about creating this idea that it's not even just a community of your seventh graders; it's of eighth graders. Or when we take our kids to Camp Tecumseh and we've got high school students leading these small groups of junior high kids, they'll be like, what, what team were you on? So I was a Globetrotter. Oh, what was it like when you did this? What's this coming? And the high school kids are talking to them, and it just makes everybody get along and feel much, much better about the school. Uh, I can't remember what do we have coming. You guys can see what's next. Okay. Go ahead. I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're not some anal retentive sequential freak, you may just kind of go, well, your head may explode when he talks about this. Because I, I tried this once. I can't do it. But if you are like he is, this is a phenomenal system. And, and we've got links to, to some of these things on my website that we'll share later. The links will explain much more about it. B points are just behavior points, or as my children call them, Broviac points. It's the token system. Basically, you get 15 behavior points to start each nine weeks. You gain points for doing good things. You lose points for doing bad things. I'm not a yeller. From when I was a kid, when adults yelled at me, I would just tune them out and go to my happy place. So as a teacher, yelling at kids for me is pointless. But I wanted to find a way to control a classroom without having to yell. So for me, I use these behavior points. And it's just, do you happen to do it? Yeah, there's Chart. I have my Hello Kitty clipboard uh, that I use. That's because a kid was throwing it out one day. I was like, this Hello Kitty, you can't throw that. And so I took it, and what it is is just a class list, all the kids' names on there, and I go across, and you can't see it from there in the picture, but it's just a point total. As they do good things in class, and it's not all the time. It's like if you bring in uh, recycling, you get points. Or if you do a homework and do well on a quiz, you can gain points. It's hard to gain points. Easy to lose points. Losing points would be talking out loud in class, having to go to your locker, having to go to the bathroom, and it costs you points whenever you have to do it. So it's just an ongoing point total. The trick is, I stick with it, and within, by this time, three weeks in, I no longer have to discipline my class. They know as soon as I pick up that pink clipboard and pick up my pen, they stop talking. It's this great version of operant learning where I don't have to yell, they know I pick up a clipboard, I'm going to start taking off points. So when they're all talking to each other, so they're saying, hey, focus, I just pick up a clipboard and go, and they just stop talking. It's amazing to watch, because they know if I have to start moving a pin, they're going to lose points. If it's something you're interested in, there's a ton of information on there. It works great if you can commit to it. The idea being is that this is something that mostly has worked in my classroom. And it's something that I've developed. And so any kid that's gone through my room, they know about behavior points. Because you gain more, you get to like 50 because it's hard to gain points. You get to choose your own seat in the classroom. And that becomes a big thing for the kids. Because if you've gained up to 50 points, you've demonstrated the fact that you're a responsible kid. So I can trust you enough to choose your own seat. And so that becomes that thing for my classroom. And they develop that in-class competition a little bit, too. So it yeah. doesn't go outside. That's just within his, his it's, room. It's also a way that we kind of get to know his kids as well, because when we see them and we know that they're a hero, we can simply say, how many B points do you have? And they tell us, and if they have, like, five, it gives us an idea of how they behave in his class. If they have, like, 55, then we kind of, again, we have an idea about that student mm -hmm. without even really having them in class. 
Yeah, and it works well for just telling parents. I can tell the parents how many points the kids have, and they can know how well they're doing and stuff like that. Okay, um, I've done, I do a big poetry notebook. I've done almost every year that I've taught. It's changed. I mean, all my, I do different stuff every year, but I try to keep some of these things consistent. So one of the shared experiences is the coffee house. It, it's nothing that probably a lot of you haven't done. I take an empty room where now we don't have any empty, and I turn it into a coffee house at the end of the nine weeks or when we do this big project where kids have been writing their own poetry. They've looked up poems. They get up and they perform their own poem. We bring in food. Technically now it's illegal, but that's okay. I tell them you're not supposed to bring this in, but if it's in here, I won't know that it's in here. I'm blind. Um, the kids come in, they decorate it, they take ownership of it. You can go and kind of get a couple. Um, and really what it does is, again, it's that going back. Past kids will talk about, you know, when's the coffee house coming up? Can I come in? I'll have eighth graders that will get passes out of their, their class to come and sit and watch the coffee house on the day and watch the seventh graders read poetry. Those rare years when I don't do it because the schedule doesn't work out or we have 189 kids one year on a team and I just couldn't get everybody to read a poem in those 45 minutes. Um, I, I will have them when they see it the next year, they get mad. Or previous year's kids, how are you not doing that with them? That lets me know that it's working. These are those kind of touchstone uh, assignments and experiences that you've got to develop for your kids. You don't do one with every unit, you know, but you've got to do one periodically. And, it, you know, talk about shared experiences. You, and Tony was talking about how you create your own. One of the ones that came up in my classes is what I call the blank assignment. We all assess. But the highest compliment that I can ever give to a student is, is I said, I want you to demonstrate to me that you understand what we have talked about, whatever the unit is. And I give them a blank piece of paper. And I said, these are your instructions and these are your limits. Please show me you understand. It is one of those things when the kids get it, because I give it out probably 10 times total in the year. It's a major deal for the kids. You'll see them posting on Instagram a picture of a blank piece of paper, and, and they'll say, I got the blank assignment. And normally the assignments that I get back from that, they're stunning. Because one, I unfettered the kid, but we'll talk about that with the assessment piece. But it is a thing for them. Uh, this is my class. We like to recreate scenes. Uh, anyone use uh, uh, reading like a historian stuff? If, you, if you're teaching social studies and you have not uh, explored into reading like a historian out of Stanford, you need to do so. It's all free. Uh, it, takes, it has a thing in there about an eyewitness, and we talk about the unreliability of eyewitnesses. So we recreate a crime in my classroom where some poor girl who looks completely innocent kills a guy. And then what we do is we take statements from the kids to teach them about critical observation skills. But I will get kids, again, who will come to me and say, have you killed anybody yet? And they'll ask the kids, have you been killed? They, I let them take pictures and these of are, that. These are things people will see in the room, like they'll see his hatchet, or they'll see when they come in, they'll see the pole on the back of the door. And they're like, what's that for? Why is that there? And he'll just, at some point, it'll come up. You know, a kid makes a mistake. It's kind of a stupid mistake. He has them walk over, and the old Gary, or Gary Larson far side comic where the kid in Middale School, the gifted, is pushing on the pole door. And so he tells the kids, go push on the pole door. You weren't thinking, you know, and they go over and they do it. Which goes to a little bit to the discipline problems. This is, I don't have discipline problems. I, have, I actually have nothing in my classroom that says anything about what happens if you're bad. The only flaw you can have in my class is a lack of understanding or thinking. And so I literally only have one punishment. You have to go to the corner for one second, hang your head in shame for embarrassing your parents because you didn't think today. And I, the secret I'll tell you that I never tell them, it's only the kids I know and I really like that go over there and do that. Um, this is, well, it was, that's kind of changed my classroom. You know, you've got to put your personality in the classroom. Mm -hmm. If your classroom looks like this with maybe like a kitty poster up here, and hang in there, you know, something like that. It's probably not going to motivate the kids to want to get to know you a little bit better. You've got to put things around your room. Now, parents will walk into my room and go, how does a kid pay attention in here? Because I've got stuff all over. I mean, this is, this is actually dramatically changing. We went desk back here, and I've got all these figures set up. But I'll do the Star Wars figures uh, on display. I've got some Walking Dead figures. I have movie posters hanging all around my room. Um, I've got the, the, the ship that Mr. Stump actually got me. Uh, but I put these things in the room just to be able to talk to kids about. You know, I have my seven periods. We have a little kind of what we call a best period. Um, it's the half hour at the end of the day, a little bit of study hall kind of time, work with kids, put falling behind. Well, I, I have some kids at the beginning of the year kind of struggling. 
You know, they weren't wanting to sit, they weren't wanting to do their work. So I kind of let them get up. They walked back behind my desk, and they were looking at some of the things that were up there. And two of them watched The Walking Dead. And so I had Walking Dead figures there. And so I got in a conversation with them about Walking Dead. I knew now, or I know now, that they're Walking Dead fans. And now they do their work during best, simply because we had a conversation about that. And, and you've got to be able to let your personality come out. You've got to showcase that in the room. I, I've got my music things up there. I've got movie things. Anything you can to, to let kids know who you are. Because if they don't know you, then you're not going to ever get to know them. Because they're not going to share a single thing with you. And I truly believe that if you don't know them and they don't know you, they're not going to learn. And my classroom's even more cluttered than his is. Uh, on the top right-hand side, that's what it looks like when you're looking at where my desk is. And then around the room, I have things. Everything you see up there on the wall was stuff given to me by students. When I first started teaching, I had an empty wall like this except for four posters the leaving teacher had given me to hang up, and that was it. And that was back in 1999 when Phantom Menace came out, and I talked about the fact that I was one of those dorks that camped out for the movie. We camped out together. We camped out. Didn't know each how other. we met each other was awesome. Uh, but the idea being is that kids, like, hey, I saw that movie. I got these figurines. You want them? I'm like, sure. And so kids would bring in stuff, and I just started putting it behind there, and it snowballed. Over the course of 15 years, I've added stuff up there. And when kids come in and parents come in, I'm like, everything you see in my room was given to me by a student. Posters, they come in. I have Twilight posters. I have Hannah Montana things. I frame them, put them up there. The kids have to sign them, and they have to write little messages on there. And so I put all of those things up there. The idea being is it shows those different parts of me and allows me to have conversations with the kids. Uh, in the left is a little thing about my life I put up there. It's my I'll get to that. embarrassing things for me. It's my report card from when I was in junior high when I had all A's except for English, which I teach when I had a B because I hated my English teacher. And so I put another fact that's like, if you don't like a teacher, it's going to affect things. And so I put up the fact that I didn't like my English teacher. And so I accept the fact you're not going to like all people. And I have dorky pictures of me when I was a kid up there because it humanizes me. And they get to see that side of me, the fact that I was a young dork when I was a kid. I've got my school pics from kindergarten through senior year in high school. And that's the little things that kids will connect. In the bottom right, I wear a tie Monday through Thursday, and I have 300 ties I've collected over the years, actually like 500. But I wear a different tie Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and the kids have to find out what theme I have. And so it's this thing that they call the tie game that the kids have just for my class. It's just that thing I've created has nothing to do with my team. It's just my classroom thing. This thing I've come up with that the kids get to buy into. And so the tie game becomes a thing that they experience in my room. I started wearing on Friday, I love t-shirts, pop culture references, a lot of times ones that the kids aren't going to know, and so I'll wear a t-shirt, and they'll ask me, I had a greatest, greatest American hero, come on, look, oh. yeah, I, wait, I can play the song right now, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I wore one the other day, and uh, two Fridays ago, and the kids came out, what is that, what is that, I'm like, I'm never going to tell you, you're going to have to figure it out, or take a picture, or do something, and, and just, so then as they kind of get to know me, they'll see on Fridays, you know, what shirt is he going to be wearing. All right, we, look. I was sharing with some folks over here. We had to deal with our first uh, female bully. Uh, it, it's got to be 12 years, a long time ago. And so what we had to do was we wanted to create a culture, but we needed it to be bigger. So we chartered the, our district's first National Junior Honor Society. And what a blessing that's been. We now have a third of our kids every year are eligible for the National Junior Honor Society and join. Our chapter right now is well over 180 kids, and we have 500 kids in that class. I mean, it is an unbelievable experience for us. And they are the best kids, and we hold them accountable for their behavior. Nothing's worse than having to come in front of the Honor Council because you decide to be do something stupid. But what we have done is, what we have found is, that has, given a, that has established a culture of being good. And one of the things that uh, Dave talked about with his B points, it's the culture of being good. But this is a very macro level view of being good. It's important to our kids because we've made it important in our school. And if you, have not, if you do not have a National Junior Honor Society culture, or not National Honor Society thing in your school, you may want to look at that. It's cheap, it's easy. And it gives the kids a place to belong. We have each of our kids that are required, but they, they join in around February of their seventh grade year, then go continue through May. And during that time, they're required to perform over a, at least minimum of 50 hours of community service. And so they do it through, they can get it all through stuff that we help set up with our elementary schools. Um, but many of them do it on, on their own time. And we tell them pretty much anything you're doing that's not for your family and you're not getting paid for or compensated in any way is community service. And so it, it really is just 
helped us quite a bit, plus it's given us a block of kids to go to for various activities that we need for the school. And we support everything in our district. There are seven elementary schools that use us and our kids for everything from their fairs to babysitting for the PTO. Back to school nights, Back to school school nights they come to us. They come to us, and it says a lot about us, about those kids, when so many people ask them back a second time. And so that's what makes a difference. And it's great advertisement for our school. You know, there are people that know our school because of our kids. Well, we've branched out and had other school districts even as Yeah, we've students. gone into a couple of elementaries in Noblesville, and yeah. Yeah, we, we live in Fishers. Carmel's Dad's Club asks our kids to volunteer for one of their program days. We always find that a little bit weird, but we support it. Oh, my God! I should watch this for a second. Don't worry about the sound. It's not, it's just a bunch of kids making some noise. These are high skill games. And high dollars. Yes. I think those I think those dodgeballs actually have a lifetime warranty on them, don't they? I think so. I know the hula hoops do. Set it up. Pause it. Go back to the uh, All right. Talk about this. What we've created to go along this whole idea of the culture in, and the competitions, we've created what's called our Charger Challenge. And the Charger Challenge is a mini Olympic-ish type thing where each of our three teams nominate 15 kids to go and compete after school. And the competition is the idea to see which of our teams is the best. And the events that we've come up with are ones that usually focus on teamwork in some way. There was the ball bounce where they got the three into a group, one kid bounces, one kid has to move a trash can, and you score points trying to get them in there. We have a hula hoop race where they have to be in a big circle and it goes around all of them. Uh, we have another one you're going to see in most of the paper plate race, which are paper plates on the ground, and you have to run there in what looks like a random order, but there's a pattern to it. There's a dodgeball part to it. And the idea being is that these kids, 15 random kids, the only thing that qualifies them is you have to have a C- minus or higher in your classes, to show us that you're a kid that's at least trying to put forth good effort. But our goal is that we get a wide range of kids, from the quiet kid to the athlete to the outgoing kid, and we bring these 15 kids together, and then they can be on a team. And it becomes a big thing to try and become part of your team's Charger Challenge competitors. And the winning team, at the end of it, gets this giant trophy that is a traveling one, like the Stanley Cup for hockey, that goes from room to room, whoever currently has it, who currently has the... Trophy is oh, this guy uh, has the trophy, and also the kids. We have a button maker that we invested in our school. It's uh, buttons are awesome. Uh, it's like 150 bucks on eBay, and we make buttons for everything. And kids love shiny objects. Uh, we make the kids a little button that they get to wear, and only the kids that win the Charger Challenge get the button. If you participate and lose, you get a handshake and a high five. But if you get to win, you get the button. So this becomes that shared experience of the kids who have won a Charger Challenge. They get a button. Plus, we've taken over part of our school hallway in one section. We've listed the name of every kid who has won the Charger Challenge. So even kids that are now in college can come back and see their name up on the wall as part of this Charger Challenge competition. And, and there is, I just hung up a, a, another QR code, and plus it's one of the links that uh, is on my website that we'll get you here later. Uh, where it, we explain each of the events that we do and kind of there's pictures of the trophy in the, in the wall so you can kind of take a look at those things. We do it every nine weeks. It's very easy to do. It does require some time commitment. We do it after school. It runs about an hour and a half after school and we just stay after with the kids and do it. And, and it could vary. You could have as many kids. I mean, if you wanted to add a few more, that'd be fine. Um, you could do it among your own students if you just wanted to do it with kids in your class. That's the thing we kind of kept trying to think about as we were going through this. It doesn't have to be team to team to team. It could be class period to class period to class period, which is the next thing we'll talk about. But we did this. We've been doing this now for, I think mean, we're in almost a decade. Yeah, a year or so. And we just, we were at B-dubs one night after we called a retreat after probably back to school night or one of those million evening events and we just decided we wanted some more competition with the kids they, you know the kids always talk about oh we don't like the heroes we wanted to give them something to compete against but that was still fun and it, it creates that team bonding it creates that unity it hits a wide variety of kids and and the kids have an absolute blast with it I mean this is one of my all-time favorite pictures and it's not even one of my students um, but when she got an answer right on our trivia portion uh, of the competition, and it was just we were just able to capture it in, in that moment. This is the hula hoop race down 
here below, and I don't know if you want to, the paper plate race is one that, had, there's a little video for that. Um, this way, set up paper plates, and all they're doing, you can tell, it's very easy to do. They're touching numbers one through ten, then they run back, tag somebody, touch the next set of numbers. First team that wins, I, that's what we try to tell the kids. Someone get nervous, start, but I, 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 I can't do anything, I'm not athletic, I can't do this. People, it's, it's easy. You know, it's just about going and having fun. And, and our, we call him Father Mike. This guy right here is an English teacher on the Stars team, and he's probably one of the nicest, biggest hearted people that you can find. And to watch him in this thing, it, it, he almost grows fangs. It's the kids see his competitive juices come out, and it's great for them to see him in this light because he's such a just an easygoing, build you up kind of guy that he loves the competition. That's just a video, we don't need to watch it, of the, oh, that's a trophy, go back. That's just you reading the, the trivia yeah. questions. There's the trophy. Very giant, founded by the side of the road, I think, didn't you? Uh, perpetual yard sale. Yeah. One for $5. <laughs> about five feet tall. Oh, yeah, about it's it's about ugly about this tall. <laughs> yeah. And then there's there's the buttons that they're brought ceremoniously into a... Uh, I have a little, uh, a little briefcase. briefcase I got from my grandma when she passed away. We just took the briefcase, it makes it all fish, and we... And you open up the briefcase, and it's just got like a little plywood in there to suck the buttons into. So it just has a little extra presentation factor, and you hand the button out to each kid. And we take a, a group picture of all the kids afterwards, like post up for them to see. And it's just finding one more way for the kids to buy in. And so it's, you're at school, but you're not necessarily just learning. It's that extra stuff that gives them a reason to be there. And then another night at uh, B Dubs, uh, we decided to take that further. And it was during Harry Potter's heyday. And so we became teams, uh, Slytherin, Hufflepuff, mm. Gryffindor. Um, but we went ahead and we expanded. For sure. Did you bring it? Uh, bring it back. <laughs> but what we've done is we actually turned that into a house competition. Again, this is free. But what we've done is everything that's positive is worth points. From joining a team to trying out for the talent show to anything that's a positive thing we earn points for, and it accumulates to this wonderful cup that we found on our <coughs> summertime BFM trip, we call it, uh, Boyfriend Mafia, named by our his wives. wife. Uh, but anyway, on a trip we found it, and so we have a traveling trophy that the kids earn, and so we keep updated points, events, leaderboards, but what we are really doing is this, like if you look at the National Honor Society, there are top kids, academically, you look at Charger Challenge, any kid with a C minus, but this is just a being good, which means any kid can be good. Any kid that makes the football team earns points. They right. to belong to it. When you have the spirit days, you know, a kid that wears a hat that day or dresses up in, for the 80s day, they earn a point for their team. Then what we started doing, we also felt, you know, junior high school is times when they don't really seem to get into the school. And I still haven't figured out exactly why they don't go and support everything. So we want kids going to events. So we decided we're going to award house points for going to the school play. We're going to designate a, a spirit game for one of one of the sporting games that, that throughout each season. So we've got a volleyball game next uh, next Monday night. Last year's spirit volleyball game, we filled our gymnasium. Normally they've got like 20 kids there. And so we just stress these things. We just had a pasta drive uh, with the Big Fishers HSE game. And we were bringing in every kid who brought in some pasta got a house point. And they earn points for themselves and for the team. That's why you see this leaderboard um, that's a list of the top 8th grade points and 7th grade points. We don't have any 7th graders right now. And we tell them, when you go to 8th grade, you're still on our team. You're still earning points for our team. Our 8th grade teachers don't, well, the 8th grade is not team. They have social studies and English repaired, and that's about it. And so we tell them, you're a globetrotter for two straight years. So anything you do as an 8th grader still helps the Globetrotter team, and you're still earning points for the end of the year. It just continues that, that identity. And that's why this is a great thing that we know teachers have done similar things just within their classroom. You know, if you don't have a team, you don't have a bunch of other teachers that you think will be able to do this, do it just in your own room. You know, you can have your first period and your second period and your third period, and you keep track of the points for each of those classes, and then you build it up that way, and then what will happen is your kids will start to talk. Now the teachers can go, why are your kids always dressing up? Why are your kids always going to the games? Why are your kids seeing like they care? They go, well, because I care. And so then maybe you can get them to do some things as well. And why this, are your kids bringing been, in all the pasta for the possible? What's that? Why are your kids bringing in all the pasta for the possible? Ex yeah, exactly right. So, and, and then we always, we highlight what things are coming up and you know, all that kind of stuff. So, it, this, has been, this has been a very, very, very good thing for us. And this is another one that I'll go hang up a new thing for. We have... Uh, 
a house points chart so you can kind of see what we award points for and those kinds of things. Um, but it's, it'll also be on my website. It is time consuming, but the payoff is big too. Well, it also helps with our discipline also. Because mm -hmm. if they do, if they get ISR and detentions and those types of things, they can lose points uh, for making bad decisions. So and I will tell you, school-wide, seventh grade, our discipline problems are near nothing. We have, I, I know for a fact, Tony and I, I haven't, well, I've never sent a kid out of my room, but I can't even remember the last kid that we... To the office? Yeah, I can't even remember. Distance learning, yeah, but that's different. All right, so how does it tie to the curriculum? If you've not seen Rita Pearson's TED Talk about uh, kids aren't going to work for you if they don't like you, uh, I highly recommend that you go watch that TED Talk. Our kids, we develop trust with our kids, and so when you have their trust, they'll follow you, and when they follow you, they'll take a risk, and sometimes those risks are academic, which is what we actually want, and so we can begin to challenge them because we make it special. I have, a giant, I have a history, I do all projects with my kids, and I would highly recommend that you guys do that. Uh, and so we do the Tang Dynasty Poetry for us, seventh grade social studies teachers. I love Tang Dynasty Poetry, it's man poetry, it's calligraphy, art, and poetry together, and the poetry is always short and about nature and one human lesson, and so I can write it. But I do the project with them, and I take my project, I put it up on my whiteboard, and say, anyone's project's better than mine, I'll put it around there, and I actually take the display case, and I put it there. It is a big deal for them, for their project to be better than mine. And so I have kids that do amazing work, simply because they are in an environment where amazing work is rewarded. They don't get just a grade, they get the recognition. Skip these and go to the take boys. <laughs> These are just examples of some assignments that we do. If you ever have a question about it, email us. There we go. All right, so these are the things that, that we think you need to be thinking about when you, and, and again, not a lot of this is earth shattering, but sometimes I think it helps to kind of just have it put it right in front of you. So you need to develop a classroom jargon that kids can identify with solely your classroom and you, or if you are teamed, you know, within a team, but definitely come up with some sort of classroom jargon, special phrases and words that you use. Something that identifies you, the thing that makes, even though you do the same stories as another teacher, what separates your room from them? That thing that puts your personality into it, and that's where the jargon comes in. The jargon, I think, comes very naturally just from your personality. It's not something that can be forced onto a kid. Uh, no matter how many times I can keep saying, that's peachy, it's just going to end up annoying the kids. It's one of those things where you just be you mm -hmm. and pick up on what the kids are reflecting back to you. They're going to pick up the jargon more than you will. It's just a matter of listening to them. Well, they carry it with them. My wife uh, used to teach at Southeastern High School, and she would have kids that we had you know, five years later. And she would hear certain words, and she'd go, you had Mr. Robiak, didn't you? And they go, yep. Or you had Mr. Fossil or Mr. Sturgeon. She could tell simply by some of the phrasing that they used or the words that they used. So that's the things they take with them. Those are the things you leave with them, not you know, necessarily the booky information. Right. right. And then creating unique experiences and assignments, again, that are exclusive to you. You've got to build those in, absolutely, uh, so that they stick with those kids. Keep going. What you want to add to them. Don't be afraid to steal from the teachers. Steal from them and then make it your own. Steal it and make it better. You can't just copy somebody else's stuff and expect it to automatically work. Oh, I, this, I, I just talked about this a second ago. It is amazing what happens when you throw the gauntlet down to kids to be great. The more you throw that gauntlet down to them to be great and show them what greatness looks like, suffer with them with the assignment, the greater their work will be. Uh, it is a... Who's who in my room? I only decorate with student work. And I put some of that stuff up there, and it's amazing to me sometimes when I look back at what those kids can do. Well, something I've stolen from him that, that goes along with this is, and it takes time, when they're doing a writing assignment, go grade it right then. Um, he has a I like sticker, like the Facebook, Facebook thumbs, thumbs up. Um, I just have another stamp. But if you, you, know, you read it and it's great work and they get a stamp, you've already graded it. So when they turn it in, you know it's good. It's done the work for you. If it's not good enough, tell them. And the, the you know, kids that are working at a higher level, maybe you give it back to them and say, not good enough. And that's all the direction that you give them. 
And other kids, you give them, okay, what, what do you mean here? What, let's you know, expound on this a little bit. So it takes time to do it, but once the class is over, half of your assignments are graded already, and there'll be better work than you were going to get to start with. Tony, ex explain you more of the room, the extension of your personality. I mean, that's obviously key. Get, let the kids get to know you. House point systems, we said, can work anywhere. It is not anything that you have to use on an entire school. It's you can start it small and then grow. You know, some of these things are not going to, you're not going to go back and go, oh, yeah, I'm going to start doing this now. It's going to take a little time, but it works. Uh, the biggest thing I would say is unity. Find a way to create unity. And that was what ours was. We wanted to find a way to have the kids come together, and house points is how we did it. Just start with your final goal of I want my kids to come together, those kids from different classes, those kids from different intelligence levels, I want them all to come together. How can we do that in my room? And then, I mean, again, nothing new, but we can't ever speak and not stress. It's all about the relationship with the kid. I mean, you, you have to get to know the kids. And I, and I mentioned the argument, you have to be intentional with it. Some of it, you love it to happen naturally, but sometimes you've got to seek out. I try to gather as much information from my kids, and I've got the binder that a lot of us will do. We'll ask them, you know, favorite things and all this kind of stuff, and I'll pick a couple of kids, and I'll go through, and I'll read, and I make sure I talk to those kids that week. You have to make it intentional. If you don't, then they're just going to wither on out of your class. And then since the need to belong is so high, if you don't give it to them, they will find that place to belong. And, and that's really what we're looking for. You, they have to want to be a part of, of you. If not, they're going to be part of something else that you probably don't want them to be a part of. I think the big thing is that, especially at the middle school, junior high, kids want to belong. It's their natural tendency. You just have to give them that little nudge to make your room that place that they want to be. It's that little thing extra. If you're homogenous and just like everyone else around you, there's no reason for them to belong to you. So you have to give that little something, that pop of personality that makes your room stand out, that gives them that reason to say, this is where I want to belong. This is the room I want to come back to every passing period to bother this teacher and awkwardly stand next to them while they're trying to do other things. You give them that reason to make them want to come back to your room. All right, so email addresses, it's all hsc.k12. I'm officially an Anthony, so I'm A Sturgeon. They won't change it to T, I don't know why. Um, also, I, I hung up a, a last little QR code back there for those of you that have it. Um, I, I can also, if you email me, or if you just actually do a search, it'll, it'll come up. I have a website. It's a Weebly website. I just started this year. If you haven't used Weebly, it's awesome. If you're looking for a website, it's free. It's so easy to yeah. use. Oh, it's great. I paid for the pro so I can upload video onto it literally in about five, ten seconds. My video is uploaded that I, that I filmed off my computer. Um, but I have an info and links section for educators on there, and it has the PDFs of all the stuff in the QR codes, plus his PDF or all his B-point stuff. And so, it absolutely scan that QR code. If you want to write it down, it's very easy. It's Mr. Sturgeon, like that, FJH, Fisher Junior High, dot Weebly dot com. Um, and like I said, there's an info and link section, and I think he's going to try to post this video of the, of the presentation and stuff on there. So. We'll get that up on a YouTube channel as well. Can you repeat uh, that, Mr. Sturgeon? Yes, Mr. Sturgeon. It's MR, Mr. Sturgeon, FJH, for Fisher Junior High. Oh, I thought you were taking a picture. I don't, no, I'm doing the video. It's dot Weebly, I'll just put that on there. W E E B L Y dot com. And there's a little menu bar, info and link section, and you'll see it. There. I put this the, up on YouTube too. Okay, yeah. Do. So the, the, the presentation will be up on YouTube also if you want to go back and glance at something or. It's been recorded. Yeah, questions, let us know. Um, contact us in any way whatsoever. Other than that.